Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the, the Heritage Foundation for a very special event, and a very special speaker, and a very special subject that uh, we're going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. Amid all the cacophony that prevails in Washington, one clear, calm voice of reason can be heard, that of George Will. When presidential candidates level conflicting charges at each other, when the government is threatened by yet another shutdown, when we become entangled in the affairs of a country 10,000 miles away, we turn to George Will to sort it all out for us. We even turn to George for an explanation of why so many pitchers need Tommy John surgery. And I, I hope he'll address that. That's George Will uh, is a Buckley, Goldwater, Reagan conservative who respects the Constitution and loves James Madison. He admits that as the government has grown ever larger, a Leviathan threatening to swallow all of us up, he's become a little more libertarian. But he still refuses to wear jeans, even on casual Fridays. Uh, without alarms or flourishes, George Will has become the acknowledged dean of political commentators in America. I, I know he looks much too young, but in point of fact, he is for 40 years, he's been a syndicated newspaper columnist, more than 30 years as a TV commentator, first with ABC and now with Fox News, and of course, a best-selling Pulitzer Prize-winning author. When Will talks, Washington listens. Who better then than to kick off our series of events that will explore lessons for conservatives from Goldwater to the Tea Party? We've asked George Will to talk about Barry Goldwater, for whom, in fact, he cast his first presidential vote in 1964, and of whom he wrote after the 2004 Republican National Convention, Barry is back. And so, George added, is his brand of conservatism that includes a muscular foreign policy, economic policies of low taxation and light regulation, and a libertarian inclination regarding cultural questions. Which prompts the question, is this the kind of conservatism that Republican candidates should offer in 2016? I look forward to George's answer as well as his other thoughts about the Arizona politician who has been called the most consequential loser in American politics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving George Will a warm heritage welcome. Thank you for that introduction. It proves that not all forms of inflation are painful. Um, <laughs> I will address Tommy John surgery in the fullness of time. I only write about politics to support my baseball habit. <laughs> Casual Friday in my office means not black tie. <laughs> uh, I do have one pair of jeans which I wore once, and that was because it was required for Jack Danforth's 70th birthday party, the music there being provided by Jerry Jeff Walker, uh, artist responsible for the epic song, Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I look around here, the, some people here are as old as I am, which is sad, and the rest of you are so young that Barry must seem something like the Peloponnesian Wars to you, a <laughs> distant memory. And I want to make it a, a little more relevant here. Uh, Faulkner famously said in his Nobel uh, lecture, that the past is never even past. And I'm here to tell you the Goldwater past is not past. It not only is present, it is, I think, in many ways, the future of the country. Bliss it was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Those, of course, were the words of William Wordsworth writing about the French Revolution. Wordsworth was born in 1770, so he was 19 years old when the Bastille fell. Uh, I was 19 years old in 1960 when at the, at, at the Chicago Convention of the Republican Party, the 
junior senator from Arizona. He, of course, was junior to Carl Hayden, who had been a sheriff in Arizona Territory. Uh, and uh, it was a little bit like Fritz Hollings served for about 40 years as the junior senator from South Carolina. But anyway, in 1990, when Barry Goldwater went to the podium, said, uh, let's grow up conservatives if you want to take that back this party, and I think we can, let's get to work. Well, he went to work, and a lot of people went to work for him. It is commonly said, and truthfully said, that the 1960s were a decade of turmoil and dissent. It is commonly and falsely said that the dissent began at Sproul Plaza at the University of Berkeley with the free speech movement of 1964. It began four years earlier at the Chicago, and the great dissent of the 1960s began in the Republican Party, and it began in the right. And it began with Barry Goldwater's insistent question, what is becoming of our country? At that time, it's hard to remember now, Goldwater having receded and conservatism having ascended, uh, that conservatism in Goldwater's form was considered naughty but not quite serious. Uh, on election night, I well remember, so to several, I was at Princeton in graduate school at the time working on my PhD, which I got intending to teach and briefly did. Um, I remember in the fall of 1964 when I got to Princeton, they did a faculty poll on the Johnson Humphrey ticket, Goldwater Miller ticket, and some other ones. Goldwater finished third in the faculty poll at Princeton. This, the peace and freedom candidate, I think, from California. <laughs> um, but I remember that I, I went to, to uh, in a little hotel room, some friends and I rented next to Columbia University where they were graduate students to watch the election returns. They were all for Johnson, I was for Goldwater. And late in the evening, someone, I think it was John Chancellor, or someone from NBC, similar Bigfoot journalist said, well, that is the last we will hear from conservatism. Goldwater having lost 44 states and received, what, 37% of the popular vote. And I remember thinking, well, we'll just see about that. Uh, it seemed to me the lesson of that night was Horace Greeley's Go West Young Man, that the future of the country lay Western, that is, lay in the uh, libertarian, wide open spaces, sense of possibility of the American West, uh, where the theme of the song and the theme of Goldwater Republicanism was the same, don't fence me in. There was a libertarian streak to it, and that libertarian streak is, I think, coming our way. In September of 1964, Bill Buckley gave a talk to the Young Americans for Freedom. This was two months before the electoral landslide, which Bill uh, saw coming. And Bill told them, be of good cheer anyway. Be of good cheer, because this is going to be a constructive loss. We are preparing the ground for the future. And it was indeed a, a bright future. The Republican Party, having been declared dead on the morning after the 1964 election, won four of the next uh, five and, and seven of the next, no, sorry, five of the next six, I believe, and seven of the next nine presidential elections, the ground having been laid by, I think, the Goldwater movement. We're hearing something similar to that this morning, all this rubbish about the Tea Party against the Republican Party. Tea Party is the Republican Party today. The Republican Party is defined by its energy. The Tea Party has the energy. The Tea Party, when it was, when it enkindled in, in 2009, could have become a third party. It could have sulked and gone home. Instead, it joined the Republican Party, which makes all the more remarkable because the Tea Party, and the mainstream media has never understood this, the Tea Party began as a reaction against the Republican governance of this country from 2001 through 2008. No child left behind. The eighth, I guess, iteration of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act passed in 1965. James Q. Wilson, the greatest social scientist of his generation, said that that, the education, uh, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was the end of what Jim Wilson called the legitimacy barrier. Hitherto, the question 
confronting Congress from, I mean, from 1789 until 1965, the first question about any legislation was, is it proper for the government to act in this sphere? That was the legitimacy barrier that had to be at least rhetorically addressed. Perfunctory attention had to be paid to it. After the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, there, that was essentially gone. Uh, the Tea Party, I think, understood this viscerally, if not quite in the sophisticated categories of James Q. Wilson. The Tea Party was enkindled before Barack Obama got their attention by the prescription drug entitlement, the first new entitlement ever passed without a dedicated burst into flame. The kindling was ample and the kindling was dry. As it was in 1964 when the precursor of the Tea Party began in the Goldwater movement, Teddy White, Theodore White, in his, the second of his many uh, the Making of the President books. In The Making of the President, 1964, said, Goldwater had a contagious concern. He introduced the condition and quality of American morality and life as a subject for political debate. Indeed, he did. I once wrote a book called Statecraft to Soulcraft, read by dozens. Uh, <laughs> It was based on my, the Godkin lectures I gave at Harvard in 1981, the thesis of which was that in the subtitle, the subtitle was what government does, not what government ought to do, but what government cannot help but do. That government, by whatever policies it adopts, by whatever values it affirms, by what other rival values it stigmatizes and discourages, cannot help but be engaged in soul crafting, having and shaping the temperament, character, values of the citizens and collectively the nation. Goldwater understood this before I did. He said, we are having an effect, not just a bad effect on the economy, and not just a deleterious effect on American freedom. We are having, with the kind of government we're, we are developing, a bad effect on the national character. This was such a novel event. Uh, at about this time, the, before Goldwater, about the time actually Goldwater got elected to the Senate, 19, what, 52, Lionel Trilling, the leading literary critic of his day at Columbia University, wrote a book called The Liberal Imagination, in which he famously said, there are no, none, no conservative ideas today in general circulation. And he was right to this extent. There were no conservative political ideas as a, organized as a fighting faith. Conservatism as an intellectual movement was largely, I think, a cultural critique. Its luminaries were T.S. Eliot, Irving Babbitt, the agrarians located around the Kenyon Review and, and uh, Vanderbilt University, Robert Penn Warren and all the rest. It was, as I say, a cultural criticism with very limited political resonance. Today, it has so much resonance that we are being uh, told that uh, conservatism is uh, uh, producing a civil war in the Republican Party. Nothing is more traditional than Republicans fighting with one another. Uh, I, I, you know, when the, when the left was fighting in one faction after another, the extreme left in this country, the <coughs> Trotskyites against the Stalinists and the Lovestoneites against the Trotskyites and all the rest, one of my favorite signs in American politics was one that said, Lovestone is a Lovestoneite, the factions becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, the left used to say with some truth, and by the left I mean Irving Kristol and others at that point in his life, used to say you can't split rotten wood. The fact is uh, fighting is a sign of intellectual vigor, and it's with us today. It's with it. We are still fighting the aftermath of the fight of 1912 arguably the most important election since the Civil War to this day. Uh, in 1912, of course, Teddy Roosevelt chafing under uh, the absence of power and proving that the absence of power corrupts absolutely, uh, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt decided to challenge a sitting incumbent president, his former friend and vice president and, and, and secretary of war, William Howard Taft. He beat Taft. He running, uh, he, Taft finished third, Woodrow Wilson won, Taft carried, I think, Utah and Vermont was all. Uh, but something important happened. It was another constructive loss. 
At a crucial moment in 1912, two leading Republicans, Ulihu Root and Henry Cabot Lodge, both of whom were close personal friends of Teddy Roosevelt's, not just friends, they loved Teddy Roosevelt. They refused to side with Teddy Roosevelt. Instead, they stuck with what they knew to be the doomed campaign of the incumbent president. Had they not done so, we would have had from then on two progressive political parties. We would have had not a choice but an echo beginning in 1912. In 1948, again, when Dewey led the party down to defeat and uh, uh, setting the stage for Everett Dirksen going to the uh, podium in 1952 at the Republican convention that was about to nominate Dwight Eisenhower, Dirksen of Illinois being a great TAF supporter, pointing to Dewey saying, we followed you down to defeat twice before. This kind of dissent within the Republican Party is absolutely normal. Now, what Dewey did that pay, pay, prepared the ground for a conservative revival was not just lose to Truman, not just to lose an eminently winnable election, not just to produce the famous Chicago Tribune headline, Dewey defeats Truman. He conducted a campaign of such rhetorical vapidity, of such complacent generality, that the Louisville Courier Journal said you can distill his speeches into four sentences. Agriculture is important. Our rivers are full of fish. You cannot have freedom without liberty. And our future lies ahead. That was 1948. 16 years later, the party went for the man known for plain speaking, Barry Goldwater. Uh, and that's why 1964, like 1912, was a constructive loss. First of all, because Barry Goldwater captured what the Taft forces maintained control of, thanks to Root and Lodge and some others, captured the party machinery. Politics in the United States is inevitably a team sport, which Barry Goldwater understood. And the team is the party, and the party machinery matters. Second. In 1964, as in 1912, the steadfastness of the candidate in the face of inevitable political adversity gave people confidence. Not just confidence that it was worth fighting and losing, but confidence that there were certain things you could say in polite society that might discomfort polite society, but we don't care. Third, in 1964, Barry Goldwater energized a whole cadre of young people, one of them not so young anymore, sitting here. Uh, there was a young uh, law student at Stanford at the time, first in his class. Third was Sandra Day O'Connor. First in his class at the Stanford Law School was uh, William Rehnquist. Went back to Arizona, was energized by Barry Goldwater, and in, 19, uh, in the 1980s was elevated to the chief justiceship, moved down the bench to the center seat by Ronald Reagan, who of course famously was catapulted to prominence and into his political career by the famous Time for Choosing speech made in October 1964, because Barry Goldwater, reading a speech that was to be given, said, it, it's good, but it doesn't sound like me. Get Ronald Reagan to give it. A very good choice. It's. It's, it's, uh, was um, two fatal years of opportunity. Between 1938 when Franklin Roosevelt proposed enlarging the Supreme Court for the purpose of packing it, and was so severely rebuked by the American electorate, that between 1938 and through 1964, there never was a liberal legislating majority in Congress. Congress prevented that with a coalition between Republicans and conservative Southern Democrats, who when I came to this town in 1970, ran the town, conservative Southern Democrats. 
Then the landslide was broken by the, the, the devastating uh, Goldwater defeat. Johnson had veto-proof uh, veto uh, majorities in both houses of Congress and would never have to veto anything anyway. And this was because Goldwater had forced the country to understand that there was another argument to be had. The country wasn't ready for it. The country would get ready for it. I have often said that Goldwater didn't lose in 1964. It just took 16 years to count the votes. <laughs> it is hard to remember now the scandalized, how scandalized people were. There's a famous story that a journalist in the press section at the Cow Palace in San Francisco where Goldwater was nominated. When Goldwater got to the famous line in his acceptance address, uh, extremism, pursuit of justice is no vice, and moder uh, uh, freedom, liberty is no vice, and moderation, pursuit of virtue, <coughs> justice is no virtue. The journalist famously rocked back in his chair and said, good God, Goldwater is going to run as Goldwater. <laughs> <coughs> what a thought. Few people realize, and this might be of interest to you, uh, that was Goldwater in 1964. In 1963, Martin Luther King in Birmingham jail wrote a letter that's a masterpiece of American political rhetoric in which he said the following, you speak of our activity in Birmingham as extreme, but though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, I am con I, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. Well, I don't actually think Barry was an extremist, because if he was, that means James Madison was. It means George Mason was. It means that the founders who gave us our vocabulary of limited government were extremists, and that's all that Barry Goldwater was insisting upon. Dr. Johnson famously said, people more often need to be reminded than instructed. Goldwater was a great reminder, a very great reminder. Now, he, he did say this about extremism at a, at a difficult time. He said it when the John Birch Society was a problem for the Republican Party, saying things like, Dwight Eisenhower was a communist, moving Russell Kirk to say, Dwight Eisenhower is not a communist, he's a golfer. <laughs> um, it was the summer, in fact, June 21st, 22nd, the night of the, in 1964, that three civil rights workers, Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney, were murdered in Neshoba County, Mississippi. So it was dangerous and probably not wise for Barry to use the words extremists, because it unleashed a kind of criticism of Goldwater that prefigured the treatment of conservatives by the mainstream media now. Let me give you one example. 1,189 registered psychiatrists answered questions about Barry Goldwater, not one of whom had ever met him. They said he was emotionally unstable, immature, cowardly, grossly psychotic, paranoid, uh, classic schizophrenic, and a dangerous lunatic. And he's the one guilty of extremism. <laughs> On the eve of uh, the convention that nominated Goldwater, Daniel Shore of CBS News, and a star of CBS News, and CBS was then the Tiffany Network, quite the exemplary thing. Goldwater had said, offhandedly that he might, after the convention, take a short vacation in Europe. Daniel Shore said the following, it looks as though Senator Goldwater, if nominated, will be starting his campaign here in Bavaria, which is where Shore was, center of Germany's right wing and Hitler's one-time stomping ground. Goldwater said Shore would be vacationing near Hitler's villa at Berchtesgaden. Shore further noted that Goldwater had given an interview to Der Spiegel appealing to right-wing elements in Germany and had agreed to speak to a gathering of right-wing Germans. So, quote, there are signs that American and German right-wings are joining up. Every sentence of that was false. Every syllable was false. 
and it was broadcast on CBS. <coughs> in October, before the election, Richard Hofstetter, the, you know, one of the luminaries of American historiography at that point, again at Columbia University, published in Harper's Magazine, his essay that later became a book called The Paranoid Style in American Politics. This was the beginning of an effort to say that conservatism is not just misguided, but a form of mental illness. Uh, again, Goldwater was supposed the extremist. It is also the case that uh, Goldwater was t particularly stigmatized because he competed for the votes of Southerners. Here it is necessary to note a few things. The Republican rise in the South began when Goldwater was running for the Senate in Arizona in 1952. In 1952, Dwight Eisenhower got 65 Southern electoral votes from Florida, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. This, mind you, was before Brown versus Board of Education. <laughs> In 1956, before the Civil Rights Movement was really underway, Eisenhower added 20 more electoral votes from Kentucky and Louisiana. Uh, it, Eisenhower in 52 and 56 and Nixon in 1960 did badly, much more worse than the Democratic nominees in those years in the Deep South, among Deep South whites. Half of the Southern electoral votes, however, were already in some sense in play in 1952, uh, well before Goldwater in 1964 decided that it was legitimate for Republicans to compete for Southern electoral votes, that being part of the United States. Congressional Republicans, it is worth remembering, were stronger for civil rights than were Democrats at that point, a higher percentage of Republican senators voted then for Democrats voted for the 1964 and 1965 Civil Rights Act. Uh, Barry Goldwater uh, objected to the 1964 Civil Rights Act mistakenly but honorably. Uh, I say mistakenly because it was time for Americans to quit insulting one another in public in front of their children. Uh, that's the essence to me of the public accommodation section of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Barry Goldwater believed, not without reason and not without honorable intellectual pedigree, that this was beyond the legitimate function of the federal government, beyond the police powers exercised in the name of regulating interstate commerce. And he had standing to say this. When he had been on the Phoenix City Council, his first public office. He had been active in passing for uh, Arizona, for Phoenix itself, a number of Civil Rights Act. He was instrumental in the founding and nurturing of the Phoenix chapter of the NAACP. The Goldwater Family Department Store was integrated very early, and he created the Air National Guard in Arizona as an integrated unit before, in 1948, Harry Truman desegregated the armed services. Furthermore, in 1964, Goldwater was appalled when George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, offered to change parties and run as Goldwater's running mate. Goldwater, for those of you who watch MSNBC, uh, understood that, that uh, George Wallace was a Democrat. Last year, on the 50th anniversary of George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door, to block the integration of the University of Alabama, MSNBC put up a chyron beneath him. It says, George Wallace, Republican. Had to be, according to the teenagers who run MSNBC. But anyway, um, uh, even in 1968, four years after Goldwater, the Deep South white vote went overwhelmingly for George Wallace, not for Richard Nixon. So it, it's, it was a very complicated time. As I say, Barry Goldwater was probably wrong, certainly wrong, uh, to vote against the 64 Civil Rights Act, but honorably wrong. Uh, wrong as a matter of uh, misunderstood principle, but as a matter of principle, and I don't think anyone ever accused Barry Goldwater of racial animosities. Uh, 
but the seed had been laid for nationalizing our elections in a very healthy way, bringing the South into the normal part of the political competition of the country. I have often said that before Ronald Reagan, there had to be Goldwater. Before Goldwater, there really had to be the National Review in the offices of which on 35th Street in Manhattan, the Goldwater candidacy was born in the creative mind of uh, Bill Rusher and then Clifton White and some others. Uh, and before National Review, there had to be a young man from Yale in 1955, Bill Buckley, who started it, thereby demonstrating the potency of little magazines. Given that, without National Review, there's no Goldwater. Without Goldwater, there's no Reagan. And without Buckley, there's no National Review. You can argue, and I have so argued, that Bill is the, certainly the most consequential journalist of the 20th century. But he would not have been if, in 1964, Goldwater had not narrowly won the California primary and been uh, uh, nominated. I get, I find it so amusing to listen to people today talk about the Republican establishment. Google the Republican establishment, that phrase, you'll get a thousand hits, a billion hits. Google Loch Ness Monster, you'll get lots of hits. Neither of them exists. Uh, and the Republican establishment, in 19, the Republican establishment died in 1964 when its house organ, the New York Herald Tribune, died. In 1966, that is, the Tribune, 1964 at the, at the convention when Goldwater was on the precipice of victory, the Republican establishment really did exist, and it could create overnight a rival candidacy in Bill Scranton, the governor of Pennsylvania. The Republican establishment was the New York Herald Tribune. It was the Rockefeller Brothers. It was the Chase Manhattan Bank. It was the editors of Time Life. It was real and it was muscular. It doesn't exist like that anymore at all. Uh, so in 1964, uh, we began the insurgency that took over the party and still maintains a kind of insurgence attitude in, as I say, I think, the Tea Party today, which simply exists, as far as I can tell, to do no more than continue to connect the Republican Party with the tradition of limited government. National Review began in 1955. The Constitution of Liberty by Frederick Hayek was published in 1960. Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom was published in 1962. In between, the bestseller of them all, The Conscience of a Conservative, was published by Barry Goldwater. It's very interesting the extent to which the conservative movement has always been a bookish movement. It was a book by a man named Weaver, had the resonant title, Ideas Have Consequences. What the conservative movement has demonstrated was that only ideas <laughs> have large and lasting consequences. Now that's kind of odd because Barry Goldwater, wonderful guy, creative force, was not an intellectual. I haven't really got a first class brain, he said, to which his wife robustly agreed. <laughs> uh, he once read a, a, a speech he was about to give. He, gave, he read it to Peggy and some of her women friends and he said, so I said, what the hell's the matter when they didn't like it? And Peggy said the following, look, this is a sophisticated audience you're writing that for. They're not a lot of lame brains like you. They don't spend their time like you looking at TV westerns. You can't give them that corn. <laughs> Barry uh, was not an intellectual, but Barry understood the role of ideas. What Oliver Wendell Holmes said of Franklin Roosevelt could very well have been said of Barry Goldwater, a second-rate intellect, but a first-rate character. And as a first-rate character, he did not flinch from having first-rate intellects around him, which is, again, why his was a loss as constructive as William Jennings Bryan's three losses for the Democratic Party were constructive, changing the vocabulary and energy and trajectory of their respective parties. And that's why, again, in 1964, Barry Goldwater looked at that speech, says, it's good, but it doesn't sound like me, get Reagan. Well, much has happened. 
I remember, if I may wax autobiographical for just a moment, in 1960 I was at Trinity College in Hartford and I was interested in politics and I was a supporter of Jack Kennedy. People tend to forget that Jack was, if anything, to the right of Richard Nixon on the Cold War issues of the day. 1964, I came back from two years in England and voted for Goldwater. What had happened? Well, in England I had seen the suffocation of a great, vibrant nation by the watery socialism of the post-war British settlement. And in Berlin, I had seen the Berlin Wall that had gone up in August of 1961. At 19, between in my stay in England, I had read Hayek. I had read the New Individualist Review, which was published by the, at the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, Stigler, Hayek, Frank Knight, all the rest. I'd gotten acquainted with the Institute of Economic Affairs, a British think tank of early heritage located in Belgravia, and it attracted the interest of a grocer's daughter from Grantham, a young backbencher named Margaret Thatcher. Things were stirring, and that's why it was so pleasing to be able to come back and vote for Goldwater. To this day, I have my, the wallpaper on my phone is James Madison. The back is a replica of the Goldwater for President button. Uh, those two are continuous parts of the American tradition of limited government. Now, Barry Goldwater knew by 1 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Time on November 22, 1963, that he was not going to be elected president. But the American people would not, after the assassination of Jack Kennedy, have three presidents in 14 months, which would have happened if he had been elected. Still, 27,178,188 voters can't be wrong. <laughs> Two of them are sitting here. Any more here, by the way? You voted for Goldwater? Yes, outstanding. Good for you guys. Um, and as I say, it took 16 years to count the votes, but elections don't just end. Elections reverberate. And this has rever reverberated a very long time. Uh, Goldwater, I used to visit uh, occasionally when I would go to Phoenix. His home was on a mesa in the valley uh, where he said he built the home where he used to camp under the stars when he would ride up there by horseback at a time when there were fewer than 100,000 people in the Valley of the Sun. Today, there are about four and a half million people there. In a sense, the geometry of his face, those sharp planes and tanned and the crow's feet around his eyes, the geometry of his face replicated the geometry of his state of Arizona. He was as a sympathetic but politically hostile commentator Richard Rovere of The New Yorker said he was the cheerful malcontent. And it was very important to be cheerful, he understood. And the cheerfulness was, I think, part of his libertarianism. When he started into politics, he wrote a letter to his brother. This was again running for the city council of Phoenix. He wrote a letter to his brother in which he said, politics ain't for life and it might be fun. Well, it turned out to be for life. And it always was fun. Barry understood that if politics isn't fun, there's really no excuse for it. And it ought to be fun because you're arguing about the destiny of the greatest country that ever lived. And what Goldwater intuited, and people at the Heritage Foundation know consciously, is that our side is going to win because we have an unfair advantage. And that is that the politics of our society is conducted inevitably in the vocabulary of the Declaration and the Constitution. It is conducted in a vocabulary hostile to progressivism. The language of American governance of our two founding documents is the language of conservatism. It cannot be co-opted by the other side, which is why in the fullness of time, the votes from 1964 really will be counted and will live uh, once again in Goldwater's America. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So now the fun, more fun continues, please, with questions, if you would, to... Uh, Sir. Yeah. You just stand up. We don't need it. Hi, my name's Dave Price. And uh, a question uh, relating to, to the uh, movement to the Tea Party. Much of what you said today, you know, you might disagree with, but you'd be hard to argue character and intellect. But sometimes when I look at what's happening today, uh, in, especially in terms, let's say, of the Tea Party, uh, I question both. Does that bother you, or do you see an intellectual element uh, that, that maybe I'm missing in, in today's in, in politics? In the Tea Party? In, in, well, in, in politics yeah. in general, but since it's here with the Tea Party, I'm just saying, in general, you, you have to admire um, energy, you have to admire that vibrancy, all the things that you spoke of. But when you mention Bill Buckley, when you mention some of the other names, I don't really see that type of leadership today. Am I missing something? That's my well, question I, to you. I don't see it in the Tea Party. The Tea Party's problem, in my judgment, is that they haven't got into politics, as I understand it. I mean, politics accepts the fact that in a democracy, all change is incremental. It requires a particular kind of patience to persuade. I mean, this is the politics of persuasion. And the Tea Party is up against the hostility of Hollywood, the media, the entertainment industry, academia. So breaking through is difficult. All the more reason to be more patient. And all the more reason not to squander millions of dollars attacking one another over minute differences. Uh, you know, and, and Trollope said in one of his novels that you can get more violence out of an argument between two Christian sects over vestments than you can between Islam and Christianity. And we're seeing this in our politics today. Get over it. You know, Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid are the problems. It's not that complicated. Uh, but uh, I think the Tea Party has a, a kind of implicit planted philosophy, national sovereignty, limited government. Uh, in a way, they're drawing upon, they say, we don't need to say it, we don't need to think it, it's been done. It's in the Federalist Papers, it's in the works of Madison and all the rest. That's not true, we do need some people, like we need a Tea Party Buckley, and that's not an oxymoron, that's the point. Uh, Elizabeth Price Foley, a very fine libertarian lawyer, has written a book on the Tea Party, that is Cambridge University Press, that takes seriously uh, the implicit the implicit political philosophy there. It shouldn't require an outsider, granted a sympathetic outsider as a law professor uh, and Elizabeth Price Foley, to make it explicit. They need some more people like that. Well, here's the problem. I'll put it in a nutshell. <clears throat> we hear much today about the discord in Washington, and Lord knows there's a lot of that. In my judgment, the big problem in American politics is a consensus. It's as broad as the Republic and deep as the Grand Canyon, and it's simply this, that we should have a large, omnipresent, omniprovident welfare state and not pay for it. Everyone's agreed on that. <laughs> the American people have a serious case of cognitive dissonance. They, they are, as a political scientist said about 50 years ago, they are ideologically and rhetorically conservative, but they're operationally liberal. They talk like Jeffersonians and vote for Hamiltonians. And the American people have to be, uh, and this is a thankless task and a politically hazardous task, they have to be brought face to face with their own divided mind. Goldwater, uh, Reagan's speech in 64 for Goldwater is called a time for choosing. It's still time, and we're still not making the choice. Now, there are those out there who are saying this is what the choice would look like. Paul Ryan's budget, for example, is as clear an example as I can think of. But it's, it's perilous territory you're tiptoeing onto. Perilous territory, not just because the Democratic Party won't even consider a chain CPI, they say, of course it's more accurate. We don't care. 
they're lo but to try and get try and talk to Republicans about means testing entitlement programs, which has to happen. I mean, we know what the future holds. We just don't know how to get there, and that's the difficulty. It, 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 what Barry believed, and he was wrong, was the conservatives in the woodwork theory that there are a whole bunch of conservatives out there who really wanted limited government, but who didn't come out and vote each year. They stayed home because they weren't offered a choice instead of an echo. And give them a choice, they'll come out. Well, they didn't come out because they're not there. There is a sturdy, robust cohort of Americans, and a not trivial minority, but a minority that really believes we should make serious progress toward limited government. But what Goldwater thought it wasn't a matter of persuading, it was a matter of eliciting them. We now know better. We're sadder and wiser, and we know it's a persuasion problem, and we got a long way to go. Sir. I'd also say, uh, say thank you for coming, but I have to present a full court press defense of Senator Goldwater against your attack on his intellectuality. And I will make a comment that I had the pl pleasure of having dinner with him in 1966 for about four hours. And I have read National Review throughout that period. And I would only ask you one question. If your wife, and I assume you're married, were to be asked today about your intellectual prowess, <laughs> what exactly would she say? La she'd call me a lame brain, as Peggy did. I rest my case. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll, uh, uh, again, uh, you can be a very creative force in politics without being an intellectual, and it's very hard to be an intellectual and be a creative force in politics. How many have been? Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison. Since then, not that many. Uh, again, it's not a disparagement of Barry. That's not his business. His business was politics. And Barry had the good sense to be advised economically by Milton Friedman, not a shabby economic advisor. Uh, and a lot of others came aboard. And it was, the, it was the beginning of the conservative movement to begin an alternative infrastructure to the liberal intellectual infrastructure of this country, the crown jewel of which you're sitting in, the Heritage Foundation. But again, that's a division of labor in the conservative movement. Barry did his part, and the Heritage Foundation does it, and we go forward. Sir. I uh, completely agree uh, with you that uh, a key to this is we have to persuade. We can't simply assume they will come forward. Yeah. Um, and my question of you is, uh, I noticed amongst the Tea Party, and I think you're right, they would change if they engaged in actual politics. Uh, and also, unfortunately, among too many conservative leaders, that they think they can beat people into changing their view by either intellectual correctness or condemnation. And it seems to me Goldwater and others, including Reagan, illustrated that you have to be a happy warrior, uh, that you have to be cheerful in order to be persuasive. And I guess my question of you is, uh, what how, do you agree, and how do we get conservatives to wage this more in the style that Goldwater did with good cheer? Well, I do agree with you, and, and I, I think it's doable. I think, um, I think the last uh, yesterday was one step on the way to this destination. That is, the, I think the sterility of intra-party fighting is now apparent. And I think the the more Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi and these people uh, strike the poses they strike, the easier it is to understand that Mitch McConnell, for all his shortcomings, is not America's problem, for Pete's sake. Uh, I mean, what is Mitch McConnell's Ace American Conservative Union rating? 100, 110? I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so I just think that the Tea Party got some of that out of its system. Uh, it's now incumbent upon Mitch McConnell and others to be gracious winners and to say, look, we're on, we're on the same team, and uh, I, I think that'll happen. Uh, Mitch McConnell's a very good friend of mine, and I think he's just 
gone way too far in his animosity. I can understand the fury he felt at not being, as he should have been, majority leader two years ago. But uh, he had the wrong targets and, and he nursed a grudge, and grudges in politics just aren't healthy. Um, you know, it, I, it, it seems to me baseball is the right sport for a democracy because it involves so much losing. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Every team goes to spring training, knows, knows it's going to win 60 games, it knows it's going to lose 60 games. You play the whole damn season to sort out the middle 42. You win 10 out of 20, you're definitionally mediocre. You win 11 out of 20, you win 89 games, and you probably play in October. It's a difference between, it's a small difference between mediocrity and the World Series. And politics is like that. <clears throat> it takes a long time, and it should. We as conservatives do not want to live in a country that can be easily swept hither and yon by the breezes that uh, professional breeze makers conjure into existence. We want a more stable country that's harder to move. We want a country in which most Americans are not thinking about politics. That's not a healthy society. It is a healthy society where a creative minority keeps the politi political fires going and addresses the healthy lack of interest on the part of the electorate. When it gets their attention, it talks to them. But we don't want to live in a society where everyone is on their tiptoes and, at the, and, and, and in a high heat about politics 24-7. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. If things are as bad as everybody knows they are, we've got $17 trillion in debt, <laughs> Social Security will go under in 2030 or 2035, Medicare is going even faster, and you can't. And you see states like Illinois or California. If people won't face reality when confronted with these proven facts, I mean, Detroit went bankrupt, and you can't get them to change. Yeah. When can you possibly get people to confront reality and start yeah. reducing the size of the government? Well, Trotsky once said, "You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you." <laughs> The president says Paul Ryan will end Medicare as we know it. Arithmetic will end <laughs> Medicare as we know it. Now, it is arguable that democracies only act under difficult problems under the lash of necessity. The British heard Churchill but didn't really listen to him until Hitler got to the Channel ports. Then they said, oh yes, this is getting serious. <laughs> now. The danger to me is that we don't have, will not have a galvanizing crisis that will instead settle for a kind of slow gathering entropy that will settle for a new normal of 2% growth, the allocation of scarcity, something for which our institutions have no experience and are not good at, uh, rather than having a galvanizing moment. The trick is to avoid a galvanizing moment which might not produce the reaction we want. It could produce an extremism of, 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 of a left-wing sort. But uh, again, the, the people, Paul Ryan and others are working on this. And the American people are not fools. They're not attentive, bless their hearts, and again, that's not bad. Uh, the American people are not attentive, but they're not fools. As I look back over the last, uh, all the presidential elections of my lifetime, they haven't made the wrong choice that many times, at least not a dramatically wrong choice. Uh, so give, give them a chance, give them a choice, give them a good argument, but do it happily. People don't want snarling people in their living rooms. This is now, a, a, politics is now intimate. Television has made it such. These people are in our living rooms at the dinner hour. Behave accordingly. Yeah. I think, I think you have it. I think the interesting thing is that the Tea Party, the people that are at the actual Tea Party, when you, there's of course a number of religious conservatives that formed groups that claimed the Tea Party name that aren't, aren't the same people that I saw at the 912 rallies and weren't the same people that I saw at. So there, there's a difference between people that call themselves Tea Party and actual Tea Party people. 
But the interesting thing I'm seeing in places like Oregon is that the, the Tea Party people are, are very positive, very happy warrior-like. And as you saw in, in Oregon yesterday, they picked the happy warrior candidate who is right. mistakenly referred to as establishment when in fact she over, that's Dr. Monica Webby, yeah. she overcame the establishment Republicans because she pulled together a coalition of the middle of the rotors and the Tea Party conservatives against the establishment Republicans and won that race by good hard work. Yeah. Let me tell you a little story, then I'll take a final question or two. Uh, four days before Ken Buck, who I like, uh, pulled out of the race this year for the Colorado Senate seat. Uh, I met with him in Colorado Springs. I said, how's it going? He said, fine. I said, where you been? He said, been down in Pueblo talking to Republican women. I said, what'd they ask you about? He said, they asked me why we're not impeaching Barack Obama. And I said, well, what did you tell him? And he said, well, I told him I'm a former prosecutor. I've had a lot of experience with selecting juries. The jury in an impeachment trial are senators. This doesn't look good. And I said, wait, wait a minute, Ken. You just generated a headline, Buck Ponders Impeachment. <laughs> That's not how you get elected to the Senate. Well, Buck's not going to be a congressman. That's good. And someone else will be a senator. I just wanted to add a, a fun piece of Go War lore to your story. First time I met him was I was asked to brief him before a speech and had some time alone with him. And he kept rubbing his face. And I said, Senator, is there anything wrong? He said, I didn't have any shaving cream this morning, so I used peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, it works really well as long as you don't worry about smelling like a peanut. Yeah, very good. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Tommy, John. Tommy John surgery. Oh, well. We're reaching the limit of the human body's, the strength of our tendons to begin with. Uh, kids are now pitching too much, too young. Travel teams, they're playing 175 games a year before they're mature. And um, we may have to lower the mound again because the higher the mound, the harder it is on your, the torque of your, your, I mean, throwing a baseball is an unnatural act. And uh, that's why people get paid so well who can do it well. But uh, it's a little bit like football, uh, which I think is a mistake. Uh, football has simply outgrown the physiology of human beings at this point. These 350-pound guys who over 20 yards, which is basically where football is played, are as fast as running backs. Uh, body's not made for that. And the way we're pitching now is not made for, we're, we're going to have to find ways to have people come to the big leagues with less wear and tear already in their arms and uh, be much more sensitive about pitching motions that put unnatural stress on what's already a highly stressful event. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>